Father, we thank you for this evening to be together, and we thank you for this community of believers that we're a part of. Pray that you'd strengthen us, um, give us endurance and stamina for this week ahead, and all that uh, you have planned for us, both the plans that we know about and the things that we'll learn about tomorrow morning. Um, we pray that in all these ways you would be glorified. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you can, please uh, follow along in your Bible or on your phone um, as we read together from the book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verses 1 through 22, which is once again the whole chapter. Um, we're, that's one way to get through Lamentations is to move through it at, at a pace here. But this is the word of the Lord to us this evening. This is his good news to his people. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He's cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He's not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he's broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He's brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He's cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He's withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He's burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He's bent his bow like an enemy, with his right hand set like a foe, and he's killed all who were delightful in our eyes in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He's poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He's swallowed up Israel. He's swallowed up all its palaces. He's laid in ruins its strongholds, and he's multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He's laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He's delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces, they raised a clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament, and they languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He's ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. The law is no more. And her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They've thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bound their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out onto the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry out to their mothers, Where is bread and wine? As they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They've not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. All who pass along they, the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and they wag their heads at the, the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty? The joy of the earth. All your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth. They cry, we have swallowed her. Ah, this is the day we long for. Now we have it. We see it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He's, he's thrown down without pity. He's made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to the Lord. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Lord, and see. 
with whom have you dealt thus? Should women, should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord, in the dust of the streets like the young and the old? My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those who I held and raised my enemy destroyed. Phew. We made it. Um, It is wonderful to be with you tonight. Um, And let me just say that for my part, I think it is a glorious and a rewarding challenge to read a passage of scripture like this together. As you can see in your bulletin, and as I've said several other times, um, we are in part two of a five-part series, walking through the book of Lamentations chapter by chapter. But next month, December, um, there's an intermission, like there's an intermission to like all normal life that tends to like go on for four or five months, it feels like. Um, I'm kind of, I like Christmas Christmas to be kind of like a, like a day. And I know that that's a minority opinion. Anyway, <laughs> there's an intermission coming, looming. I can see it on the horizon. Um, we will not meet the first Sunday of December, but we will meet Saturday the 15th. And you have that in your bulletin. Um, we'll meet in this room, but it'll look completely different. There won't be any preaching, if that encourages you to come. Um, there will just be readings of scripture, and there will be hymns that we'll sing, familiar hymns, hymns that you have heard before and you know, um, and we'll sing them and we'll read scripture about the coming of Jesus at Christmas and Advent, and, um, and we'll celebrate together. So that's on December 15th. But back to the topic at hand. We're trying to ask a really specific question of this text, and that question is, how do we lament? You see it on your bulletin. And you may be thinking to yourself, isn't that a really unhelpful uh, question? As if we were reading Mark and asking something like, what is a gospel? Or reading Revelation, and our main question is like, how do we reveal things? Or something. Um, But I'd urge you to lean into that question as much as you can. Think about it. How do you lament? Uh, How do you speak to God about things that feel godless? How do you make sense of your experiences when Jesus doesn't seem obvious or involved or concerned? How do you doubt, but doubt productively as a Christian and struggle productively as a Christian without falling into despair? The question, how do we lament, is a really interesting one because it assumes in kind of a a nuanced way that we do or that we should lament, right? Because we're asking how to do it well. And I think that assumption in itself makes the whole experience worthwhile because it is essential as God's people that we bring our concerns and our fears and our frustrations and our suffering to the Lord. Uh, Because if we don't, then really the life of faith is a life of make-believe. It's a life of pretending. And so we've got to learn how to talk about hard things. Um, And so we need to learn how to do that well. And the book of Lamentations is a really great place to do that and to begin. Now, last time we looked at the first chapter, and I argued that our lamenting um, must involve placing our experiences alongside the promises of God. In other words, when we bring our brokenness um, and the brokenness of our situations before the Lord, we should do so by declaring alongside those broken things um, promises that we feel like have been left unrealized or unfulfilled, things that don't make sense. That if this is the case, and this is what I'm suffering, and yet your word tells me this, this doesn't jive. And so, for example, if we feel like our plans aren't coming to fruition, or we have doubts as to whether God's really guiding us, um, you know, am I even, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this voice that I've been following, is this you, or is all this kind of vanity? Well, we declare those things honestly. We put names to them. We describe them. We articulate them. But we do that alongside promises. um, Promises about good things that God longs to give us. That he wants to give us a hope and a future, right? Jeremiah Jeremiah 29, 11, which we've all heard or learned before. Or that he comes to give us an abundant life. um, A life of fullness. A rich life. 
Um, and we place these things together and, then, and we actually speak these things in prayer. We do it. We, we say them out loud or in our, in our prayer closet. And that's what it means to lament. That's our first lesson. This week, things get a little stickier, though, because in the second chapter of Lamentations, the author is grappling um, with something that becomes a little bit more piercing. As I read it, the overall theme of the second chapter, um, especially the first half, is God's just anger against the daughter of Zion, which is the tribe of Judah, the southern tribe. God is absolutely the antagonist in this poem, unabashedly. He's the one who's placed his people in this incredibly dire situation. It's an act of punishment. It's an act of discipline. And it's one that they've deserved because of Judah's sin against him. And so because they've turned away, he sent the Babylonians to burn their capital city to the ground and to slaughter the inhabitants or to leave them destitute and near death. And the author goes to great lengths to kind of paint that vision of suffering in graphic detail to the point where by the end of the second chapter, it's becoming a little hard to read. And so we need to talk about wrath tonight. Uh, because as Lamentations teaches us, acknowledging God's wrath is part of making our lament before the Lord. And so to do that, I want to ask three uh, smaller questions beneath this larger question that we're asking tonight. What is the wrath of God? Um, what does the wrath of God look like? Um, how, do we, how do we tell that what we're experiencing is the wrath of God when it's there? And then three, why does it matter to acknowledge God's wrath? Why should we acknowledge God's wrath? Does that make sense? Three moves. Um, classic sermon. You guys should all do well. Let's begin. What is the wrath of God? Traditionally, Christianity and Judaism have talked about God's wrath as a function of two things. First, the wrath of God stems from his holiness. And second, the wrath of God stems from his faithfulness. So holiness and faithfulness. And um, in order to move forward, I want to talk about each of these in turn. So the first, that God's wrath comes about as a result of his holiness, is probably the more famous of the two. Uh, because for reasons that will become clear, it's a little simpler to grasp. In fact, you probably heard Sunday school lessons about this. The argument is essentially that because God is holy, which means he is completely pure and absolutely righteous, and he's set apart. He therefore cannot stand anything that is unholy in his presence. And so what we call God's wrath is more like God's inherent aversion to everything that stands against him. Um, sin, suffering, death, idols, um, you name it. Now one of the things that this first definition of wrath uh, gets right is that it describes God accurately as one who stands diametrically opposed to sin in all of its forms. God cannot and will not stomach unholiness. He issues an unequivocal rejection of all that opposes him, and he always has. And so when we talk about just anger, um, it isn't like the anger that you and I have. In fact, it's not even really an emotional um, thing at all, strictly speaking. God is unchanging. And his anger stems from his moral perfection as our creator. And so wrath isn't something he has when he stubs his toe. And it's not really an effect of his mood at any given moment. No, it's, it's this stable, consistent, inherent thing. It's almost like a principle. So what, make God, what makes God angry today will make him angry tomorrow. And sin will always be on that list because if God is holy by nature, sin is a rejection of that holiness. Um, the two are antithesis. So they're mutually exclusive. Does that make sense? It's probably not a new way of talking about God's wrath, but it's a good way and it's an important way. Because to understand the basic elements of the gospel, we must see that God wouldn't be God if he simply accommodated evil. Um, or if salvation was brought about by some kind of compromise on God's part. And that's what this first idea tries to defend. Wrath isn't circumstantial in God, but it is endemic to who he is at the most basic, essential level. But at the same time, 
If that's all we can say, and if by wrath we really only mean something like an allergy, that God's relationship with sin is like oil and water, well, then I think we're missing something important. Because it's true that God's nature is opposed to sin, and so he does have this kind of magnetic, mutually exclusive repulsion about the way that he confronts and condemns evil things, but it's also true that God is absolutely free. And so we shouldn't think about his wrath merely as some kind of natural compulsion or even a limitation in God, like that that God has to play by a set of rules. Um, And this is where the second idea comes into play, that God's wrath is not only a function of his holiness, but it's a function of his faithfulness. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that even though God's wrath is not like human anger, it also isn't something that is impersonal in God. Rather, his wrath is a choice that he makes. And a choice that's determined by what he's trying to accomplish. And we talked some about this last time. But God has particular purposes in the world. And he makes promises. And he declares particular things. He takes sides. He approves of some things and disapproves of others. And he isn't some gigantic, unfeeling, logical machine. Or he's not just some big human being that has to behave according to certain rules. Um, He's not the universe. He's not just sort of the way things are. And the way that in God's wrath is really just shorthand for karma. That when you do something bad, something's going to come and get you. No, he's a personal God. And he chooses to exercise his judgment in accordance with his greater mission in the world. Which, as we see in scripture, is actually not condemnation. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's adoption. That's where his purpose and goal is going. And so wrath is a cognizant reaction in God, not a mechanical reflex. It's something he's in control of expressing or not. Something he can withhold or not. And the choice is his because he's absolutely free. Now, lest you think I've completely abandoned Lamentations too at this point, let me give you a verse that actually declares this very idea. Look, look down at verse 17. The author says, The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He's thrown down without pity. He's made the enemy rejoice over you and exalt, exalted the might of your foes. Did you catch that? It's not, it's not God's attributes that drive him to act the way he does in Lamentations. It's that he has some kind of, it's, it's not that he has some kind of natural aversion to evil. No, it's his will and it's his covenant with Israel that has determined this terrible atrocity in Jerusalem. Even in his discipline, the, the Lord always does what he purposes. He chooses to do this and he carries out his word. And so with respect to his faithfulness, God's wrath is the free exercise of his judgment, insofar as that judgment furthers his purposes for the world. It's not an allergy. It's not a mechanism. It's not a reflex. It's something that our God is in complete and utter control over. And you need both of these ideas to really capture God's wrath with any clarity. On the one hand, God would not be God without the total and absolute judgment of sin, a judgment which he exudes by his very nature. Like light, that when it's in a dark room, dispels darkness by its very nature. God is against evil, but he would also not be God without the mercy that he shows the sinner. The withholding of that wrath, or the redirection of it in accordance with his love. And the only place where both of these things come together, this holiness and this faithfulness, the only place there where these things are exercised to the greatest extent possible is the cross. God can't pretend that evil doesn't exist because he loves us and that love prevents him from make-believing that we're perfect. And his holiness demands unqualified victory over all evil. He has to do that. That's his goal. But that holiness serves the ends of his faithfulness. There's a prioritization here that God loves us and that love drives him towards mercy. It's actually his mercy that's the goal all along. And so he exercises justice fully on the cross so that real mercy, and not pretend mercy, not a mistrial of justice somehow, but mercy that refuses to transcend holiness, 
Mercy that's made possible by God's absolute annihilation of his son on the cross. He does that so that he can purchase love and mercy for you and I. Access to the throne, as Hebrews says. That's what the cross is about. That's the centerpiece of our faith and our hope as followers of Jesus. That God is absolutely just and absolutely merciful and that justice serves the ends of his mercy. That's all on the cross. I quoted, I quoted Karl Barth on your uh, program. And some of you know how big a fan I am of Karl Barth. Total fanboy of Barth's work. But listen to how he talks about this. And this is going to appear like an unusually long quote. So just kind of soak it in. Um, let, it, let it steep. Um, he says this. And if you're interested in looking this up, this is in, the, uh, in Church Dogmatics 4.2. So that's probably like the, like the ninth volume of Church Dogmatics. So, but go look it up on your own in your own, your own copy of uh, Bart, which I know you all sleep right next to. Uh, <laughs> the critics of the term wrath of God were quite right, excuse me, were quite wrong when they said that wrath is not a quality or activity or attitude which can be explained in the light of God's being or brought into harmony with his love and grace. I'll summarize. In other words, some people don't think a God of love is compatible with a God of wrath. But, in reply to this criticism, Bart says, we have to say plainly that the grace of God would not be grace if it were separated from the holiness in which God causes only his own and therefore his good will to prevail and be done, holding aloof from and opposing everything that is contrary to it, judging and excluding and destroying Everything that resists it. In other words, first, we have to say that wrath is God's by nature opposition to and victory over anything that opposes him. And grace would not be grace if it were bound to any single form of its appearance and manifestation. If God always had to show himself monotonously as love or what we think of as love. If he were not permitted to negate that which, he has, which has to be negated, if he cannot conceal himself when he's resisted, revealing his grace only in the alien form of unwillingness and wrath. In other words, Bart's saying, because God is free, because he's God and he's not just some big human being, he's free to show grace in ways that don't even look like grace to you and I. God is free to show wrath when he wants to show wrath and he's free to show mercy when he wants to show mercy because that's who he is by nature. But he continues, Above all, grace would not be grace, the serious and effective address of God to man, the effective establishment of fellowship with him, if God did not oppose the man's opposition to himself. If he left man to go his own way, unaccused and uncondemned and unpunished, if he ignored the miserable pride of man, if the man of sin had nothing to fear from him, if it were not a fearful thing to fall into his hands, Bart's saying, not only would grace not be grace if it wasn't firmly set against evil and if it wasn't free, but it would also not be grace if it let our opposition to God go unchecked. That would not be love. It's not love if you let your kid eat cookies for dinner every night. Grace has to have some grit and it has to guide us to, to what is good for us. We believe in a God who doesn't let things slide, even in his mercy, even in his love. And he goes on, almost done. That his grace would not be grace without his judgment is just as true as the supposed opposite with which it is indissolubly connected. That there is no holiness of God which can be separated from his grace and therefore no wrath of God that can be anything other than the redemptive fire of his love which has its final and proper work in the fact that for our sake, for the sake of man fallen in sin and guilt, he did not spare his only son. The reason God's wrath is such a complicated thing to talk about and the reason our minds um, probably immediately run to that famous Jonathan Edwards sermon uh, about sinners in the hands of an angry God is because when we talk about God's wrath, we're really talking about his love. The two are the same thing. It's what happens when a God who is holy is also a God who is faithful. It's what happens when, as I will soon find out, when a father has to discipline his son or daughter. It's the same thing in God. It's that love. It's a love that's hemmed in 
and, and directed towards the flourishing of the person that it's directed to. God wants Israel to flourish. As awful and as grotesque as Lamentations 2 looks, it's all directed there. Wrath is what happens when a God who is just is also a God who is merciful. Um, and we should all read Bart if we get the chance. So let's move on. If God's wrath is, as we've just said, a function of his holiness and faithfulness, and it's his opposition to everything, everything that opposes him, that can sometimes feel like judgment and yet other times feel like forbearance. Well, what does this actually look like in our lives? And how do we know that when we are experiencing something hard or, or some form of suffering, how do we know if we're experiencing God's wrath or not? There's a fascinating verse um, in the book of Amos. It comes in chapter 3. Um, it's actually several verses. So I'm going to start reading in verse, th- verse 3 of chapter 3. Listen to this. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? This is, you'll, you'll see this several times in the Old Testament. I just want to point you to the fact that I think this is funny. Um, there's a parallelism that's happening in Hebrew poetry, right? So we'll say something and then we'll say it again in kind of different words. The Hebrew po- people love to talk about lions. And then for the parallel, they just add young to the lion. And so the lion does something in the first rung of the parallelism. And then a young lion does something different. And I always think that's funny. Anyway, does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there's no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? These are all rhetorical questions, right? And listen to this line. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? It's a really apt summary of Lamentations 2 because for the author, it's, it's taken for granted that what's happening to Jerusalem is God's fault. And it's, it, it's by God's hand. The destruction of Judah isn't bad luck. It's not, you know, just geopolitics working out the way that they're working out. No, without question, it's, it's insisting on the fact that this is an instance of God's wrath. He's the one who's to blame. One commentator put it this way. The main point of Lamentations 2 is that it was Yahweh himself who destroyed city and people. So does that mean that whenever we experience suffering, we should immediately suspect it's God's wrath at work in our lives? Is every bad thing that happens to you an act of God's judgment? Well, that idea probably makes you as nervous as it makes me, or hopefully makes you as nervous as it makes me. I grew up uh, five minutes from Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and, uh, which was also the headquarters of the Christian Broadcasting Network. And so it felt like every morning I'd wake up and I'd read in the local paper about some new faux pas uh, that Pat, Robert, Pat Robertson had committed or some strange interpretation he'd announced the day before on CBN. I remember in 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, he told the public that God had sent the storm to punish us because Americans had legalized abortion. Um, He said on air after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti that the Haitian people deserved it because they had literally made a pact with the devil to provide them independence from the French and that God was smiting them for it. Um, Actually, thinking back on it, it feels like every embarrassing Pat Robertson gaffe Um, I experienced as a Virginia Beach teenager resulted from the confidence he had that natural disasters were clear examples of God's judgment and wrath. I don't think Lamentations is trying to grant us that same confidence to attribute all suffering in our lives to God's hand and God's wrath. I think that's a dangerously speculative way to live. Um, And really, the opposite claim, I think, is just as dangerous, to see every good thing that happens to you as an act of God's blessing. No, I believe that the author speaks confidently about God as the antagonist here in chapter 2 because he knows the sins of Jerusalem and Judah. He's done that work that we talked about, about placing God's promises alongside the suffering of his people. And so he can clearly see the ways that they've rejected him, that they haven't measured up to his covenant. 
and that they've deserved what they've now suffered. And that's a stern word, isn't it? Because we're superstitious. We fool ourselves into thinking that God instantly rewards or punishes us based on our consciences. And so you may be tempted to see every instance of you not getting what you want as God's wrath upon your sin, or vice versa. Every instance of blessing is some reward for being a good person. But our lives don't really work that way. We need to remember here that God is slow to anger. He's just, and his displeasure is to be feared. But as we've already said, his wrath always serves the ends of his mercy. That's his goal. And so God doesn't fly off the handle, um, and he isn't temperamental. His discipline in your life is measured, and it's appropriate. It's hemmed in, and it's directed by his ultimate desire to be reconciled with you. That, that's what God wants. God doesn't believe in retribution for retribution's sake. God is not vindictive in that sense. And so if we think we're truly experiencing the wrath of God, the wrath that feels unmistakably like judgment, maybe even abandonment, as it did for Israel, then we're probably further along the road than we thought. God's probably given us ample opportunity to course correct in the past. He's giving us chances to move to a different path and to follow a different way, but we've kept relentlessly going down this path. And because we haven't followed him, his displeasure is now obvious in this kind of brutal, unmistakable way. You can think about it almost like a rubber band. When your communion with God is sweet, and when you're attentive to his spirit, and when you're obedient to his word, well, then you're close with the Father, and the bond of love that binds you is comfortable, right? It's slack. It's secure, but it's, it's, it fits you. But the further you drift, the less you practice that intimacy, and the colder you grow to God's purposes for you and his guidance in your life, well, the more you may feel that same bond growing taut. What once was comfortable now feels coercive. It feels painful. What was once obvious before because it was reassuring and stable, well, now it feels restrictive, like the stretching of a rubber band to its limit. Maybe that's one way we can think about the wrath of God in a more practical way. God's wrath isn't something that flares up because of his temper or really even because he runs out of patience with you because he has that patience with you in super abundance. No, his wrath is really that same love that will comfort you when you're close. It's just that the farther we drift from him, the more angry that love appears and feels. There is meaningless suffering. That's true. But the suffering that comes from God's condemnation is the suffering that we inflict upon ourselves when we kind of tug at that rubber band. And that's a different thing. A different thing, I would argue, than Katrina or the earthquake in Haiti. So last question, why should we acknowledge God's wrath? And hopefully this is where everything just magically comes together because this is kind of the heart of the sermon, right? Um, but let me first try and answer it actually by addressing uh, the converse. What happens when we don't acknowledge God's wrath and our lament? What if God's wrath is never an option when we try and take stock of our suffering and our frustrations and our doubts? Well, there are at least two options as I can see. First, if we never acknowledge God's wrath, then we may not be acknowledging God's presence at all. And I see this in myself all the time. I am very wary of over-spiritualizing my experiences of suffering. And maybe it's just my aversion to Pat Robertson. Um, I don't know. But it is strong, whatever it is. And so when something doesn't go right, or when something bad happens, if I suffer some kind of tragedy, I'm pretty suspicious of anyone who sees God's hand in it so clearly and so specifically. I prefer to see things as mistakes and accidents, as coincidences. And if I'm really intent on blaming someone, if it's just not good enough for me, it doesn't make me feel good enough to just kind of chalk it up to chance, then I blame myself. That tends to be uh, how I function. And the problem with that is obvious, right? Because God is Lord of all and he is at work in me in ways that I can't see or imagine or even understand. 
There are no coincidences in the life of faith because God's purposes are found in every facet of our lives, and we need to practice acknowledging that presence, albeit prayerfully and carefully, but we need to practice seeing him. And so often I don't. I just assume that it's a coincidence or a happenstance. So that's the first potential problem. The second, I think, is worse. And maybe that's just because I have the first problem. But the second is is at least equally as bad. Maybe we do acknowledge that God is present in our circumstances, but his wrath is never on the table as a viable explanation because we can never admit that we're in the wrong. This, it seems to me, is more dangerous because ultimately it will deprive you of the comfort of the gospel. Can you admit that you have sinned? Can you see and easily identify the ways that you've turned God's will for your life aside? And when you become aware of it, when you know that you've done something wrong, is it something that you mourn over? If you've been a Christian for a while, do you find that you're getting more and more frustrated with sins that used to not even be on your radar? Things that you never even really conceived of as a sin or a problem, now they're just they loom large. Or are you just not really self-aware of any of those? Do you struggle against sin? Is it always in your, your purview for your day when you're thinking about what you're doing and how you're interacting with people? Are you cognizant of the way that God is calling you to live a certain way? Or are you just going for it? Do you see the ways that your heart is still bent and crooked? And are you cognizant of the way that That sin in your life brings God's judgment and discipline upon you. That really will bring God's wrath. If we can admit that God is somehow at work when we suffer, if we can acknowledge our sin and thereby acknowledge God's wrath, then suddenly our experience of suffering isn't just meaningless circumstance. We're not just floating through life. Uh, We talked about this morning, the God of the gaps. We're not just floating through life assuming that we'll interact with God when we can't explain something. You will never change if you cannot see where change is necessary. Or put it another way, you will never receive forgiveness if you're never aware that you need it. That's why we must acknowledge God's wrath when we see it in our lives, because it is that love that is trying to pull us back into communion with him. Look with me at verse 14. I think you'll see the warning even more clearly here. The author says, Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They've not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes. They've not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. Now, historically, the author is calling out idolatry, right? He's telling the Israelites that they've looked to other gods, gods that have justified their rebellion against Yahweh. The prophets in Judah were supposed to admonish the people. They're supposed to call them out, but they didn't. And so Israel's iniquity was never exposed. It listened to the voices it wanted to hear. And it was deceived by them. Is that true in your own life? Have you avoided any and every offense, any sense of condemnation and guilt? Have you left that explanation that maybe this is God's wrath? God's wrath feels like a really powerful, uh, old world kind of thing. But have you acknowledged that that might be at work in your life too? I wonder, have we censored the prophetic voices in our lives, both internally and externally? Have we surrounded ourselves with convenient support and refused to hear anything else? To borrow from the language in verse 10, do the voices that we've surrounded ourselves with, the ones who we're supposed to glean wisdom from, do they simply sit on the ground in silence? Why should we acknowledge God's wrath? Because it's really there. It's really present in your life and it's present in my life as his children whom he disciplines. And to deny that is to seal ourselves off not only from his judgment, not only from his the rod that might hit us and get us back in line, but the rod that brings comfort. The rod and staff that bring comfort to us. Let me conclude. I talked a lot about God's wrath and why acknowledging wrath is an important part of issuing laments before God when we suffer, but how do we do this? What does it look like? This is where it gets very complicated. Um, 
some people have seen four uh, people who are much more clever sermon writers and expositors of Scripture than I am. They see four distinct suggestions in verse 19. So look with me there if you can. The author says, Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the night watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Do you see those four commands, those four imperatives? Arise, cry out, pour out, and lift up. I think that that's helpful. Probably not immensely so. Probably not in a practical way. Um, And maybe that's just going to be the case. Um, at the end of a lesson like this. There's really no pattern here to follow. There's not three, um, three great ways to lament about God's wrath for your life. Um, it's more of an attitude to emulate. We're headed towards chapter 3, and that's maybe the only chapter in Lamentations that people know, where the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and His mercies are new every morning. You've probably sung those things. In fact, we sung them this morning, didn't we? That's all right around the corner. But here we're faced with something much more foreboding. As it says in verse 5, the Lord has become like an enemy. And so we're faced with the reality that bringing our laments before God must involve taking stock of his wrath, his holiness and faithfulness as it comes into contact with all that is unholy and unfaithful in us. That really does exist. And hopefully I've done something to... Get us to see that it's not some esoteric theological idea, but it's operating in you right now. Don't justify yourself when you lament. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this scripture. And we ask you to bless us as we leave. Um, Give us what we need. Uh, Strengthen us for the day. Give us our daily sustenance, Lord. We ask all this in your Son's name. Amen.